Hello boys and girls. In this video we are going to discuss extensively the following theorem. The axiom of choice implies excluded middle. We are going to discuss this in a set theory context. Uh, we'll start with speaking a bit, little bit about the history. Um, it's the 70s theorem initially proven in a, a topos theory context. Um, and the nice thing about this video, this is so to speak my pitch right away, is that for compared to other videos for me, it will have an extensive amount of dog pictures. And this is because I will start off with a story that will sort of give the semantics to understand the theorem. Um, you, the proof that we are going to discuss is like fully formal. I mean, it's more formal than what you would find on some typical math textbooks actually and much more extensive that you will find on any Wikipedia site. That's why the video is probably an hour long if you find this on YouTube. Um, I have poured myself some hard alcohol and I recommend you actually do the same. I think this is this sort of analysis that is a little bit more comfy if you're a little bit tipsy. Um, and so with this pitch aside, before the dog pictures and actually before the theorem to which we will probably get around the 15 minute mark or so or 20 minute mark uh, let me uh, say a little bit more concretely what uh, the theorem is going to be so if you have the set theory uh, meaning uh, in this context because you know we are going to prove an implication for excluded middle so that we don't assume the excluded middle from the start. We have a set theory without excluded middle, a constructive set theory. Um, but if you have uh, extensionality, as you know it from Zimelo Frankel, axiom of extensionality, it's a crucial point, and um, some form of separation axiom. If you come from Zimelo Frankel, then you, know, you can just take any class or any uh, property and uh, use it to define other subsets we are going to define uh, make two definitions of subsets from just the finite set with two elements and if we then postulate that the axiom of choice holds meaning that uh, you know for every set of inhabited sets there is a choice function a function which takes any set and reaches into it and picks one element in set set um, then this implies uh, P or not P. This uh, implies the excluded middle for all uh, properties P, at least those which are allowed in your separation axiom. But again, if you come from Zimmel Frankel and you think of like general separation axiom, then that just means every every P. Um, yeah, um, uh, what's uh, nice is that uh, there's, like, if you want, you can say there's a, a lot of factors to blame for why that happens. In particular, extensionality and and uh, uh, separation, and we will going to anal ana analyze this a little bit. But so a little bit for context, um, this was proven in the 70s in the form you see here on the screen. Let me scroll up a little bit. So I've linked the paper. Um, you find all the the, the, t the whole text for this presentation um, at the bottom. But uh, as you can see here, you know, if you don't know what these words mean, then never mind. You don't have to even read it. We will not really use it. Um, this is proven in a category theoretical context, in a topos theoretical context. Basically says that the axiom of choice here, which is uh, roughly speaking formulated in terms of inverses of functions, um, it uh, implies that there's complements for every sub object um, that you define. We will also, you know, we speak of, of subclasses, of subsets, and I will have a section before we actually prove the theorem where I discuss how subsets function in a constructive context, which is a little bit more richer than a classical context. You know, in a classical context, uh, everything like splits into, in some sense, um, more neatly than it does if you don't have excluded middle. We will see what that means and we will see it with the semantic um, with the semantic uh, story that I will give. Okay, this is the only picture of a cat I have here, um, 
but you know i just have this this meme since 10 years on my computer and i was glad i can finally use it i actually had this on a t-shirt once okay <laughs> in any case so here is the the rough uh, overview of sections in this video so i will give you this doc story that i came up with um, which i would say fits very nicely um, with the ingredients in the proof um, and uh, has some you know light touch to it and we can actually refer back to that this semantic example uh, throughout the proof and, and check everything that we uh, like state and and, uh, and proof uh, in terms of that and it will make sense okay there is a section about logic axioms and set theory definitions you can skip that with the timestamps at the bottom although I mean, if you come and are more, you, know, you don't have so much background, maybe in uh, like proofing stuff in a constructive context, then I would nevertheless recommend that you watch that. I did a video at one point about about set theory axioms. No, it was about logic axioms. Actually, the set theory part was not so so much discussed, but um, that uh, that might help in general. Like, you know, if you, I mean, this is just one theorem. It's good to have in your background. It's good to know, but as it's just a statement of which sort of postulate implies which it's not something you use all the time um but uh i suppose you come also to the video to understand how to how to do math without this and that axiom without choice or without lem or without i don't know which to find out which set theory axioms are sort of dangerous or have strong implications and um just to see like how which which sort of uh, attack vectors there are for proofs and how you do that then i would also you know watch that as i said this video is going to be a little bit more formal than what you find in a you know to, like for example the wikipedia page on that proof is pre pretty bad i would say and also um, some books naturally don't really have the time you see here i'm you know i'm ranting i'm drinking um and uh, you might get some like a little bit more of the harsh formal a to b uh, deduction rule mathematics by watching this than just reading so don't expect that i, I will hurry through this okay um yeah after two and three uh, we will prove the axiom of choice this is uh, the, the main block of this theory the the, the proof itself is probably short it's probably going to be 10 minutes or less and then there's some other angles from which we uh, we will look at it. We will discuss it a little bit more classically and see where's the difference, why things happen, how things collapse, like how your math mathematical world kind of simplifies if you adopt an excluded middle. And oh yeah, as a bonus, I will also then uh, prove that the axiom of regularity, as you know it from Simile Frankel, also implies excluded middle. Um, after we have done the main steps in, the, in point four, uh, proofing choice implies uh, lem uh, this will actually be like a very short proof it's like two sentences or so okay so story time this is going to be the section with the most uh, doc pictures so the story goes like this you are uh, working at um, some rescue dog training facility okay and you get to the dog shelter every year and you train your dogs and the, the aim is to find the, the two best dogs for the rescue job okay so we um there's a bunch of dogs that you will train in this year let's say there are like these 10 dogs um for simplicity we, we let's say the dogs don't have names we just name them by number zero to nine they each have their their name um so for example this the dog number seven uh th i mean i do this mostly so that i don't have to use full names in any of the proofs right i will just use letters and numbers as you do in math um but for the story's sake let's say this is the numbers of the dogs the enumerated dogs um okay so you get the dogs and you uh, want to find the two best um there will only like in in the proof of the the theorem we will actually only use the two dogs as you said it's a theorem um, in terms of this subsets of this uh, uh set with the zero in it and the one in, in it and this will be our like this will be our best dogs and in terms of those we will formulate this theorem okay um 
So uh, what you actually need is uh, two dogs because there is um, there's two teams. There is an avalanche rescue uh, dog team, right? So if an avalanche comes down, then uh, you oh, there's somebody under the snow, and then you need a dog to dig them out or something like that. <laughs> and so there is an avalanche team, and also there is a, a beach res a rescue team. I chosen these scenarios for A and B, right? Clever. <laughs> um, and these are the teams, right? So the dogs are the numbers. The the teams are going to be modeled as sets. Okay, so there's there's the avalanche team and there's the beach team. And um, in uh, in one of the two dogs, uh, let's say, was found to be the best dog capable of dealing with snow. So the the um, first dog, and you know, incidentally, the best ones will be zero and one. So then the dog zero is in the avalanche team and the dog uh, one is in the beach team. And uh, then uh, this is the one thing. So you have two dogs and two teams. Um, but uh, there is another factor to the story. Namely, there is a, an illness going around. So I think I call this, yeah, this is the dog pox. Uh, and so there's a sickness and, uh, uh, that the dogs could contract, right? And so if um, the um, dogs, uh, if, uh, if, if it's not the case that you know that the dogs got the immunization, as you see in here, this, this picture, let's say there's some way of like preventing any spreading or what, then if you don't have that, then they cannot work together, right? And you cannot like have them work together uh, because you don't want to them infect each other or whatnot. So um, the the thing is that you have these two teams, but if they both got the immunization, then they can actually work together in both jobs, right? They can bo both work together in, in the avalanche situations and in the beach situations. And in this case, the two teams, the A team and the B team, the avalanche team and the beach team, they are actually going to become just one team, right? If you say, if you, if both dogs are in the avalanche team, um, then um, that means that they both got uh, the immunization. And so if you, it doesn't really matter if you say avalanche team or beach team, it's the same team, right? And so here is where extensionality uh, then comes in. If both teams actually have just both of these dogs, then this is actually just one team. And by extensionality, the, this te these teams would then be equated, okay? Yeah, okay, but now it's the case that uh, these dogs, that right, you got them uh, from, this, uh, from this shelter where people just brought the dogs in and you trained the dogs there and saw which are the best. And they may or may not uh, have uh, come with an immunization pass. And if you open the pass, you see, oh, this dog got the um, immunization. For each dog, you can have the pass or you don't have the pass. And if you have the pass, then they either got the immunization or not. So only if you have the immunization of a dog, let's say, let's say dog number seven, right? You, let's say you have the immunization pass for the dog number seven. In this case, you know whether or not dog number seven got the immunization or if it did not get the immunization. Um, so there is this, this uh, predicate I, which means is uh, immunized, immunized. Um, and for dog number seven, you couldn't say, "Hey, this either this uh, you know I can I can prove with this with this pass I can certify that the dog got the immunization." Or if the if he doesn't have the immunization stamp, then you so then you know that the dog did not get the immunization, right? These are two options. But the the issue here, and that's why the, where this constructive modeling comes into play, if you didn't ever get an immunization pass for a dog, let's say for number dog number five, you didn't get Im an immunization pass, then you can not witness either of the scenarios that I just described. You cannot um, witness that it is five is immunized, but you can also not certify that he is not not immunized, that the dog is not immunized, right? So in this case, um, you you don't have a sort of um, you know you, the you read the um, propositions from your sub subjective uh, view, your capability to certify where, uh, like the status of the dog. 
and there is not just uh, two options in which you can find yourself it's 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 not the case that you can either certify that the dog is immunized or you can certify that the dog is not immunized it could also be the case that you cannot do either of those things and in this way um, the excluded middle does not necessarily hold right so this is similar to um, to uh, pr the proof provability reading right so you can say uh, provenly this theorem is true or provenly this theory is wrong or you don't know yet and then you're somewhere in between so to speak the excluded middle uh, does not hold the, the, the another option is uh, it's not the case that another, that another option is excluded um, okay so uh, we will discuss this for set theory more extensively and you will get a better feel um, how, how to deal with that and I will say a little bit about language as well okay um, yeah, and again, this is the story, like now you know what the, the discrete elements are, like the zero and one are going to be dogs and you can distinguish these dogs. Um, the teams is going to be syn synonymous with, with sets. Um, but I want to emphasize that the proof will be 100% formal and will have nothing to do with dogs per se. This is just a semantic reading. Okay. So far, so good. Get something to drink. Okay, so in, in the next 10 minutes or so, I will um, just say something about set theory. I have this short section highlighting some, um, some uh, you know, tautologies um, that I will going to use. Um, I will, you know, as in a textbook, so to speak, my um, my proof style will be a, like a constant rewriting, and I will point out when something implies something or is equivalent with it. And this is why I formulated this sort of um, uh, rules. Uh, you know, you could also do v dash, but um, I will I will formulate them in sort of rewriting rules. I say I, I allow myself to use distributivity. You know, these are all like this is like half of the the axioms of uh, of you know pro propositional logic and I highlight those because they, these will all play a significant role in our proof so you know distributivity of and and or um, then uh, you know elimination rules and uh, introduction rules so here I call them more like category theoretical speaking projection and, and insertions for and and or and then uh, the things which have to do with negation so uh, uh, you know, uh, proof of negation. If a, a pr proposition implies a contradiction, then it's not the case. Uh, disjunctive syllogism, um, which, by the way, does not hold in in minimal logic, but um, we will make use of that. So, if you have uh, a proof for uh, A and B, and then also a proof for not B or phi and psi, and also a proof for not psi, then you can deduce according to this rule that phi holds and then um, yeah, contraposition as well okay so um, some set theory axioms okay uh, the, the ones with that we are uh, use are basically these five so you have extensionality saying that um, if two sets x and y uh, share all members exactly then uh, the two sets x and y are charged to be the same and the the other direction holds automatically you know by by substitution rule um, for equality if two sets are um, equal then you can substitute them in all uh, pr uh, propositions and so it goes in both directions so equality will mean um, the two uh, sets have the same elements and this is extremely important for the proof um, because I mean, there's different notions of uh, of equality, right? I mean, there's various uh, you know, requirements of. You, I, I talk about the alternatives to that, right? If you're not dealing with, with sets, for example, or if you say you will have, you want to have a bijection in some sense, some isomorphism, um, or you know, equivalences in some fancy type theories. Here we will use the standard extensionality concept for equality. And this, uh, like a major part of the proof, will be that that means um, that that uh, whether or not two 
sets are the same might not be decidable and this is where basically the the hardness of the constructive approach comes from so to speak and because we're dealing on the other hand with this distinguishable dogs the distinguish distinguishable natural numbers the finite amount of natural numbers zero and one and the the proof basically works because the choice function mediates between these two worlds that are the complicated world with, with generic subsets defined with some generic pr predicates uh, on the one hand and with this finite set of naturals on the other hand so this is like the, one of the sort of major concepts that you will see crystallizes and why things work out as they do okay axiom of pairing axiom of union um I mean, I will not discuss this here. Uh, axiom of separation saying that, um, you know, you can take a, a set and a proposition which, or a predicate which basically defines a class and you can intersect them and in this way separate out um, a subset from a set. And, you know, before I talked a little bit about uh, separate, like the P for which separation, you know, uh, holds. But that I mean is you, whenever you have this axiom uh, schema, where you say, okay, um, this axiom is really an axiom for each proposition. Then you can also make like restrictions and this is done. You, yeah, there's then set theorists that say, you know, we don't adopt full separation, but we only adopt separation if the, the, the predicate there has no quantifier. So something like that, you can make a restriction. Then you, you get a weaker axiom, obviously, right? You say you cannot make subsets with any, any um, pr um, predicate, but only with this and that. And I pointed out because this is sometimes done and in this case the axiom might prove the law of excluded middle for fewer uh, predicates but um, for the sake of uh, in discussing the proof let's say we have full separation separation holds for all sets um, the proof goes through and then you can reflect on oh if I have uh, a more stricter separation axiom then it holds for fewer things um, but it will not affect the proof anyway Okay, and finally, uh, empty set. Empty set, we basically just need um, to get a zero, right? We are going to model, as is usual, the number zero as the empty set. And this is what the axiom says, zero exists. Okay, um, as I said, you know, I will do the proof, but then later I will discuss the proof and reflect on it. And I say a little bit about compu computability. And uh, for that, um, I would want a theory which kind of at least which at least which at least has like a model of um, hitting or piano arithmetic. Um, and for that, um, I might have uh, I might want some um, some more axioms. So here you see um, three more uh, strong infinity um, says that the, like like the empty set axiom my set exists, but a much bigger set exists, namely. The von Neumann ordinals, all numbers exist. We, we will not need all numbers, we will just need the, the two. <laughs> but um, this says the all numbers exist and, and some form of induction exists. Replacement and exponentiation uh, for finite domains. So if you have like a range of seven numbers and another set, say the natural numbers, then you say all the, the tuples of seven numbers exist, where the functions from seven to natural numbers exist and so uh this is an uh, sort of power axiom and um so roughly speaking with that you have basically arithmetic and then you can actually discuss uh, you know models of arithmetic in that and computability and all these kind of things so um i will need not need i think i will not need this for the proof at all but um for the later discussions okay and then just to be complete right because you know i don't want to be so so for, for all the for all the Zermelo lovers uh, here, I will like, just bridge away how to go from from this theory to Zermelo Frankel. So you can of course say exponenti exponentiation for all uh, sets, and then you have function spaces. Then your theory suddenly looks like uh, you know standard type theory, and then you can also do um, analysis in the sense of how a type theory can do analysis um, and. Further, uh, you know, you can have natural number induction, so not just the weak induction from the strong infinity axiom, but like induction for you know all the predicates in your set theory. Uh, or you can r um, ramp it up even more. This should be an eight. Um, and say uh, you have epsilon induction, uh, which is basically the same as regularity in 
in the Tamilo theory. Uh, but as we will see, it's, uh, regularity implies excluded middle. So this is you have to rewrite the regularity, and this is epsilon induction. It's basically it's basically basically strong induction, right? Where you say if if a proposition uh, is true for all numbers up to a, a certain number, and that implies it is also true for the next number, then it's true for all numbers. This is basically thus, but for sets. So it's not like you don't have, you know, you view the natural numbers as this linear order and induction along that, but you have like induction which goes for all sets, uh, starting from the empty set, and like conceptually, and this is that. Um, and then you can add exclude and middle. In that case, uh, exponentiation just becomes as strong as power set, and then you have Timilo Frankel. Okay. Um, okay. So um, here is a list of some basic definitions um, that I want you to keep in mind because they will be relevant for the proof. I will not say anything complicated here. If everything you see here in the picture is clear to you, you can just skip a few minutes ahead. Um, I'm pointing out that if you have this subset, uh, which we will define at that, but I introduce basically um, set the notation here, set builder notation, um, and say what that means. Like we will do this unpacking also in the proof. That's why I'm pointing, I'm pointing out. And but really, like in in terms of first order logic, where there's no brackets uh, in reality, like this is notation uh, in, in the usual approaches. So this all translates to something in terms of the logical symbols and the membership um, relation, you know, backslash in. And so that just means that um, I tell you about subset, you know, this is subset equal. Maybe it would be better if to write subset equal here. I say that this uh, is, is a tautology because, you know, that this just says that that you can take, just take this and you project the left element out. Right? This is the, the projection, the, the end projection or the end elimination in re, um, like logic speak. And so this holds also tautologically. And, uh, you know, we have defined equality in terms of all subs, uh, all elements are the same. And then you, you like in one, two steps, you also see that means if two subsets are su like, if two sets are subsets of each other, then they're also the same. Like, this is just a like higher level, um, definition, like, a, you know, one, one, one rank above, so to speak, uh, definition of equality of sets. Okay, um, we have defined union. Uh, by the way, it's worth highlighting for that we have adopted the axiom of union. If we then adopt axiom of uh, an infinite set, then we also have capability to uh, do infinite unions, right? We will not need that for the proof, but later uh, it's relevant to get uh, the, the piano arithmetic model, but okay. Um, so with that, the, the binary union, or the, the union over uh, a pair, um, for X and also this pair, X and X, or the singleton, uh, we have the successor. We said um, empty set exists. Uh, we introduce the symbol. Otherwise, everything would be like complicated formulas, but we just use the zero symbol. And then we can also define other symbols, right? One, um, zero and one will be the only one that are really relevant. I can also de define the two, um, which will also pop up in the, uh, in the proof, but I will just call it the set with zero and one in it and and so on you know that i guess okay um we will in the regularity proof make use of this uh, you know accidental relation that the one in this model is equal to the set holding zero we can also uh we can also do these proofs both for the choice lamp proof and the regularity length proof without zero and one the only feature that we use of them is actually uh, what I've written down here, that these um, you know finite elements, these small objects, are distinguishable. And um, okay, I you know I could go into natural numbers now, but I, I will not. I will try not to speak of stuff that we don't really need for the proof. So um, yeah, we will not need this relation for the proof of uh, the choice lem theorem, but for the regularity one, I will make use of this little fact. I, you know, I pointed out, out because I, I, I use the symbols, but this is not a natural number fact. This is just a set theory effect. 
Um, okay. And uh, then one note on language. So this is just if you, you know, if you're already aware of some like flavor of constructive mathematics, then you don't need that. But just for like, if you don't have so much experience with that, uh, it's worth uh, highlighting some sloppiness that I will also commit, right? So, um, you know, the classical reading, if you, if you assert I is, you, you could say I is true, or if you assert the, that, uh, you know, not I, you could say I is false. The constructive reading should always be like um, that, uh, I guess the best thing is this here, you say it's, pro um, it's provenly true, um, uh, or yeah, it's proven really true. But then I, I want to highlight that that basically means so if you have a uh, intuitionistic logic, like before you apply any semantics, I mean my my silly dog semantics by side. If you have formal semantics like, you know, hiding algebra stuff, uh, I've talked about this on this channel. Um, then uh, you impose an interpretation, um, but for the same logic there might be more interpretations and before you have any particular semantics then the um, intuitionistic logic is particularly open right you don't assign any uh, any truth value so for example here in the dog case you know I speak about um, the dog is immunized is provenly immunized or provenly not immunized uh, or you have no um, way of um, of telling you can cannot certify either of those so the way I talk about it um, sounds like like a sort of free valued system because I my you know the example is so restricted um, but it's I think it's most helpful to to um, think of the situation as the extreme cases of uh, provenly true provenly not true and then a spectrum in between basically right because uh really we're dealing with a set theory here where we have like so many uh propositions that we could write down and i think it's uh, unhelpful to to just say maybe to all of them as if they would be the same right this is then not this, this sort of do doesn't go together with how how sec set extensionality equates sets or subsets defined in terms of undecidable predicates okay this is just a side note like if you think about it this 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 dog situation th there's these extremes and then there's the a broad in between and um don't try to assign uh semantics to it unless you do that formally unless you study the formal semantics of it okay um and i will also say uh, like i think it's common to say it's provably true um but this um this should uh, be read as provenly true right so it, I, I, don't, I don't want you to think that provably true means um if you are in if you have something which you have not proven then uh it's in the in the, in the spectrum right and uh, even if i say um it's not proven provably true right this this should not mean that it's impossible to prove right the the, the in between could be false and could be true in, can go in both directions i'm you know, this is just this stupid letter Pro like provenly true and prov provably true okay if that confused you more uh then it helped then just ignore it i just want you i want um, you to be aware that uh, you know provably true uh for something which you have not proven uh it's not you know you don't say it's it's you don't you don't say it's blue proof of it's provably true for something uh, where you, you have some, some, some outside reason that it's proof of, provable if you have not proved yet. Okay, so never mind. I um, uh, don't want to hang up on, on this language, but it's sort of accidental and, and maybe I'm not, uh, not so helpful. Okay. Yeah, um, to, uh, to prove uh, excluded middle constructively, right, to prove uh, I or not I again means to actually prove either of those. Um, contrast that, for example, with if you think about uh, uh, proofs inside of the theory of piano arithmetic, in which you can formulate, uh, let's say, the, the consistency of piano arithmetic, right? You can have formalization that piano arithmetic 
does not prove a contradiction, does not prove zero is one, then uh, there's the, then uh, uh, this this good little meta theorem that piano arithmetic will not, uh, you know, it cannot prove that it's consistent, it cannot prove it's not uh, consistent, it will not decide this proposition. However, piano arithmetic has the law of excluded middle, so piano arithmetic will prove that one of those is true, even if it's not capable of proving either, right? So there's this sort of, there's this sort of emergence of, of why, uh, like in, in formal mathematics, that is actually uh, like interesting because there are situations where there's like literally unprovable uh, statements. So you see, Piano arithmetic has this, the, the, the situation, for example, also that you cannot prove a thing or its negation, but uh, sort of by accident, by the excluded middle being adopted as an axiom in piano arithmetic, it will prove that that either of those hold. Um, so then, uh, this is not the, not not the case for the sort of reading that we do here with set theory. Um, if we cannot prove either, then unless we add more axioms like the choice axioms which collapses the in between possibilities then it will not prove that p or not p holds okay um good uh so one last thing before we actually jump to the proof uh is in case you don't know at all how um like basic set theory in a constructive reading holds i, I give you a list of sort of examples and point out some pitfalls you might have if you only know the like, lamb case. So, as I said, we have this this list of dogs, um, and if this is given as um, this list, you know, this is also set builder notation. This really stands for um, if you have a term or a set T in D, then this represents a conjunction of ten terms. Basically, it just says. You know, t in d just means either t is zero or either t, or, or t is one or t is two, t is three, and so on and so forth. And given, for example, the number three, um, we can prove that three is three, so three is in d. Okay, <laughs> super basic set theory. Okay, now, um, yeah, let's say you certify the you know immunization status positively for some of the dogs for one, five, uh, and three. Uh, and okay, let me actually let me actually rewrite this. So this is the, this is the the page. Um, just so that we are clear. Um, that I'm not too sloppy here. Okay, so say you collected certificate you know, immunization. Uh, but um, or let's say and call so and I, I just write it here so so particularly to say you have these three dogs for which you uh, have a positive immunization status so that means, oh, come on. Um, that means uh, I of one, I of five, I of seven um, is provenly true, and also provenly does hold that two, the dog two is not immunized. Right, you got the certificate for two and you opened it and you don't have the stamp of immunization for the dog pox so you can certify you know for sure that the dog too uh like you know it does not have the the immunization right of course this story presumes that you take like absolutely for granted that the um the the dog uh, does not have that so basically we go by what what can you actually um like you know prove about the dog if anybody would ask you can actually hand in the, the certificate and say see there is no um uh, there's no certificate so we cannot allow to have this dog um join an, a team with a, with another 
uh, dog, right? So this is this is so the, the value you have there. And uh, then coming back, you know, to to the arithmetic uh, examples and and uh, constructive versus cl classic set theory as well. Uh, the in, if, in mathematics, um, I mean, you know, logic does not only apply to mathematics. For example, my dog example is much more like common language. But in, in mathematical terms, of course, when I say certify a witness, I, I mean on a mathematic mathematics sites uh, proofs, like actually having a proof term, either like very formal in terms of lambda calculus or um, Kolmogorov interpretation or um, informally just saying you have um, you have a proof to actually claim or assert some uh, proposition okay um so uh, you know for these five dogs one five seven two three you actually have proven something you have proven you are you have the certificate you have the witness um you have the the, the pass the immunization pass to um to know how to deal with the dog based on on what you have in your hand so you have uh these these five propositions you can make and so if i form the subset um all dogs for which we provenly um know that they are uh, immunized then you know having proven that you know to prove that i is in the set we have to prove that i is a dog okay so one is a dog sure and we have uh, the, you know, the certificate for the immunization status, which is the case. So here we we would know that um, I is uh, that one. Why, uh, why say I? One is in this subset of D. And uh, similarly, if you would assert, you know, in a in an implication, if we would assert it, um, an an object T is in this is uh, set, then you know, this statement T subset as a t element and this set uh, really means that t is in d and i holds for t so we would think thereby claim we would just the, the statement this statement here t ele element of this set is the same as saying t is a dog and t is um provenly um, immunized and if this was a, uh, like a you know, nicer type theory then the proof would actually be part of the language and we could also like ins extract the proof um, in um, for uh, you know a proof my assertion um, here this is the the uh, condition part of this implication and so we would say assuming I have the proof um, then uh, would follow that you know both that it's a dog and um, that it's immunized, you know, you can both derive that. This is how this projection, the left projection, the right projection, so to speak. Um, you, the left projection would be T is a dog, assuming this on the right projection would be uh, T is immunized. Okay, um, I know there's a little bit extensive, but this is the part where, you know, I just introduced some uh, formal logic and in particular the constructive reading of the constructive set theory to you here. Okay, oh, here's another dog picture. <laughs> Okay, so some more, some more. Um, after this, the proof starts. If if the, this gets boring, skip forward. But uh, if you don't know this, you should you should watch. Um, so, okay, uh, we have also already shown it before. Like this was this sort of line was one of the example lines that I said is a tautology, right? Since this claim means you uh, like every element is as an element of D and for it holds that they are immunized, then this is trivially a subset of D because this is just a weaker condition. This just says um, all the elements which are dogs and this just says all elements which are dogs which are immunized. And if they're dogs and immunized, then they're dogs in particular, okay. Um, we have uh, seen this, right? I, I said that um, one is in that set, so of course, uh, one is in the set, five is in the set, three, uh, three is in the set, uh, seven is in the set, and so uh, as a set together, as this finite set, uh, it is also a subset of that. Um, and okay, this is even more trivial. This is sort of the transitivity of subset relation. Okay. Um, here, if I claim that um, all dogs which are immunized are a subset of one, five, and three, right? then this actually means that this set is equal to 
is equal to one, three, and five, right? Because I, I said before that if two subsets are, if two sets are subsets of each other, then they are equal, right? This was one of the, the derived statements from the axiom of extensionality. And we have already like argued that this holds if the if the opposite holds then both sides hold and then this is true right and they are equal but i want to point out that constructively uh this is a strong statement because it excludes um the it it, it excludes that the in-betweens can be uh you know proven in the mathematics terms or in this case in terms of dogs immunized right so it, it, it actually rules out that there is like it, it's clear that uh, those uh, dogs which are provenly not immunized are um, not in in that set and um, but the point is constructively if you cannot certify either of those um, but it's still it's still possible right so for example if there's uh, there's some claim which like in, in mathematics if there's some claim for which you just have not found the the proof or the disproof then you can think of it as in this spectrum area right and so there's terms which you cannot assign in either direction yet so to claim that uh that there is really just these three elements like at most three uh, elements which uh, are in that set of I'm immunized, like if, if you say that cannot change in what is like the, this is the final assertion, then uh, you make a strong statement about all the, the in-between um, terms as well, right? So as an example here, um, let's say, uh, you know, eight was not one of the, those for which um, we have found either, so right? So I left out here four and eight and six. So uh, the immunization status of the dog eight is not known in either direction. We, we have not yet like, proven that it's immunized. We have not yet proven that it's not immunized because we just don't have the, the, the pass. We have to, don't have the, certific the certificate. Eight might be one of those dogs that in principle can go, can go either way, right? The, the reading of it is that it is not yet proven, right? In, in either way, um, but uh, you can, I mean, you know that you can take a constructive theory and add extrude middle, but you can you can collapse the whole theory. You can say, oh, oh, you know, these dogs for which we pre previously didn't decide it, this might like in in after adding more axioms, they might actually be not immunized, and and some other dogs for which we have not decided the status, they might actually be a part of the uh, immunized crowd. So you have to leave open the possibility to go either way, right? And um, so, you know, this assertion we cannot, we cannot make. We, we have not the information, the witness, the certificate that eight is immunized. Um, we know that eight is a dog, but um, since this is undecided, this is also undecided. So if we claim the thing here, right? If you say that we know, like, for sure, right? If you say, if it is actually the case that all immun provenly immunized dogs are among these three, then this excludes eight from ever being like immunized, like it, it ever, from the, the immunization status ever being proven for the dog for the dog eight, right? And so this then implies that the um, the dog eight is not immunized right? because it's not in the in the set of dogs. It's definitely not in the set of dogs per assumption of, of immunized dogs there. And so this suddenly then decides I of eight, right? It rejects it. Right? So the point here is that this this uh, this set um, there's not just the the dogs which are immunized or not immunized, but there's this in between spectrum, and this must be le be left open. And if I make such a strong claim that I say all dogs that are immunized are already among those, then that means for all other dogs that they are not immunized, right? I just want you to, to see the strength of this, this uh, statement. And you know, if we go back, um, here we have uh, one, uh, five and three. These are um, three of the, I don't know, 10 dogs. If I make this claim, then I say all other dogs, all other uh, seven dogs or you know, six dogs, all, um, how many they are. I think I, I went down to 
to nine here. Okay, so these are 10 dogs. So then I would say all other ten, uh, seven dogs are not immunized. So I would suddenly have a sharp like binary situation if I make this statement. And this relates to uh, the topos theory um, claim that we saw before, right? So you don't really like ignore this if you don't know any topos theory, but it says here, the theorem as originally stated was in topos theory, the excellent choice that every uh, sub object has a complement. So this is what happens if you make um, a top choice, then suddenly lamb holes. And if you have something uh, that decides everything formally at least where, where at least formally you say there's only two options and not no spectrum in between then uh, if you build the subsets of some uh, objects with which uh, you, you say have this and this property then everything else must not have the property okay so this is what that says okay Okay, so yeah, yeah. I mean, g given the fact that um, we already know that um, uh, this thing is a subset of that, uh, this this claim is is as strong as this claim. Okay, this is not so, maybe not so interesting. Okay, yeah. Uh, yes, and, and in the same flavor, right? If you have um, the the subset of all dogs which are provenly immunized or provenly not immunized right then um, this is a subset of d um, but it is not necessarily equal to d right because there may be dogs for example the dog number eight for which we cannot decide the proposition we cannot decide this we, we don't we don't actually have a proof that they're immunized on, or, or proof that they're not immunized right um, and to claim that D is a subset of it, right? Uh, simply by the definition of the subset relation as we've written it down before, right? Uh, let me scroll up actually. So simply by this um, here, X being subset of Y means that for all um, U of, of all sets, if they are in this, then they are also in this, but this is the definition of subset. So if we write down that D is a subset of this set. Um, then we claim that for all elements in D, it holds that there are elements of this set and fulfill therefore all its pro their properties. And so this decides I actually, right? So the subset claims are strong claims because they affect all the uh, properties that are used to define the subsets, right? This is extremely important for the proof as well of how we get to the situation where the, the the axiom of choice which gives us a function which acts on a set of subsets um, how that can imply something about the proposition uh, this is exactly this the connection right the separation axiom connects the sets even if they're simple sets like the sets that just hold the zero and the one if we build subsets, then suddenly we have a set which is def defined in terms of uh, a, some predicate. And if you then make strong you know, claims about subset relations or existence claims inside of the sets, then this can decide in this sense, excluded middle for the, the proposition used in there. Um, and uh, in the case of this, uh, the axiom of choice situation uh, and also in the regularity situation, um, what uh, what does the trick is that the fact that a function um, is defined in terms of an exist in existence claim, right? I did not write down the, the definition of a function, but in, in our set theoretical model, as is usual, the function will be a set of pairs where for every input there is a unique output. This is the de definition of a function. And if you build the, the set of all left entries for these pairs in the function, then you get the domain. Um, so I didn't write it down, but this is like the definition of the, the function. And that because they're the postulating that a function exists, by postulating a bunch of unique existence claims, um, this sort of effect will come to play where suddenly you can look into the set and basically pull out the, the pro proposition in terms of which the subset is defined. And then you just find that it happens to be decidable in the proof. 
Okay. Um, yeah, okay. But your, as I said in general, this subset of D, if you don't have excluded middle, is not provably equal, you know, with the extensionality to D. Because extension, like equality between sets, as we saw, is defined by being able to prove that all elements are the same. But if we are not able to decide immunization or any undecidable proposition, uh, then these sets, which obviously are classically the same set, are not constructively. Okay, so I know this was a little bit extensive. I'm already talking for an hour, but um, you had the timestamps, I suppose. I thought I could get through it in half an hour, but okay. Okay, so now we will get uh, to the proof. So um, the, in terms of the, the dog scenario, right? Um, we have the situation, you know, I continue the story. We have the situation that we had these this 10 dogs and we found the two best dogs. And for convenience sake, I say the best dogs were the zero and the one dog. The, the dog with the name zero and the dog with the name one. And um, I want to emphasize, it does not really matter which numbers these are. The only thing that we will use is that two numbers are distinguishable, right? It's provably the case that zero and one are not the same, essentially because the one holds provably the, the other and not the other way around in the, in the Neumann model. Um, so we have these dogs. And uh, in the rest of the uh, presentation, um, we are going to talk in terms of the predicate or proposition really phi, uh, P. And P, you can think of it as a generic proposition which might be undecidable. For the sake of this story, um, so it makes sense, the proposition will be that both of these dogs are immunized, right? And we say in the story, if both are immunized, then they can also you know, work together and then they join teams. And the crucial part is here that if um, both are immunized, then the avalanche team and the beach team become the same uh, team extensionality will collapse them but given the fact that we might not have the the uh, immunization status you know you can imagine that you, you have maybe you have it a positive immunization status for the dog zero but you don't have any pass for dog one so you can not actually design it you no know, it's it's in the, in the spectrum space and so p m might also be um undecided right so you you don't you cannot judge is, is, is be true or not if you get the, the paper the pass and you find oh the dog one was also immunized if, if, if it's handed in then suddenly p becomes true provably and if uh, you find the opposite you get a pass but it says it's not immunized then suddenly p becomes false um and so this is the the, the game that we are playing here right we have these two extremes uh, provably false provably um true and in between and p is such an undecided a priori predicate and um, we have the story here but think of p as a generic predicate in your set theory from now okay um and you know as i said we adopt uh, general separation axiom so we can form subsets using p um if you <laughs> if you have a, a really strange axiom which says you can form subsets but not if they are about dogs Okay, then um, you would not find the excluded middle for this P, but let's, for the sake of simplicity, say separation holds for all predicates. Um, okay, and so what we what we do is, according to the story, uh, we form the, uh, the following teams. The avalanche team is um, the team which is allowed in principle, like the first condition says, uh, dog one and, and dog uh, zero, they can be in it in principle, but there's a further condition it says okay the dog zero is in the team you know dog zero is very good with snow we put it we put the dog in the avalanche team and then for the dog uh, one he can also join the team if both dogs are provenly immunized right so if both dogs are provenly immunized then a becomes just the finite set with the two dogs in it and vice versa for B, the beach team, the dog one was the best. Um, you know, we can also call the, we can also do, call the dog zero, the, the Ellie, uh, Ellis and the dog, uh, dog one, Bob. And so Bob is in the beach team for sure. And if the uh, both are immunized, then 
actually both can join a beach team then in both the, the two dogs then in case that both are immunized work together in both teams so what then happens is by extensionality a and b the two the avalanche team and the, and the beach team become actually the same team right you can call it the avalanche beach team and so in the case this is uh, true they become the same now in the other case where we provenly know that one of the dogs is not immunized so that p is actually also provenly false then what happens is that they cannot join both the team because you know one of them uh, is infectious so we cannot let, let them work, work together but what then happens is that the, the avalanche team becomes a singleton team where there's just alice the dog zero in it and the beach uh, in the same spiel the uh the the beach team doesn't only hold bob only hold the dog one and so suddenly if we provenly know that p is false meaning either of the dogs is provenly not immunized then uh, we have two singleton teams okay and now finally the situation is as follows you know your boss says uh hey uh you know i know last year you tra trained the dogs uh you know so long and i hope you finally came up with uh, you know the team but you know our rule regarding immunization blah 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 um can you please uh, like specify to me you know let's say you have to telegram it to her or something um ha tell me for each team at least one of the dogs that i know from the shelter uh, who is in it right she asks give me a choice function basically and for the sake of the argument we say we want that this um, this choice uh, like function, this specification, you know, one dog per team uh, must actually be done in this set theoretical way. So what she actually wants is a proper mathematical set theory function, right? This is also important for the for the proof to go through because if we're, if we're talking about some other form of list or type theory, then um, we might not have all the axioms to actually go through with the proof, but we're doing set theory here. So the, the boss wants a set function specification. So she wants a, a, a collection of pairs which behave like uh, a choice function for every team, one member. Um, so she wants an F which goes from the set holding the teams into the union of teams which will be the just the two dogs with the property that um, the entry which has a on the left side gives a member of a on the right side in tuple and similar for b right and now the um, the theorem is that you can actually not do that Right. You, the theorem is you can not give your boss this choice function because the theorem, like the mathematical theorem, is that if you are given such a choice function, if you claim that there exists such a choice function, then this actually implies uh, excluded middle, meaning this implies that you actually know the immunization status. But clearly, if you don't know the immunization status, then you cannot suddenly know it. So you c cannot possibly come up with. Uh, if a choice function so again you know going away from the dog semantics the theorem says if um for every set of non-empty sets or inhabited sets um there exists a choice function then this implies excluded middle and the proof is done exactly with this a and b and i can already like sort of spoil why this is the case because if you actually had a choice function and it's you know as a mathematical choice function, a set of pairs, then shortly speaking, if set choice function um, has only, uh, if the choice function has two entries, like two pairs that map, map the a, P, a team and the B team, then that means that the A and B team cannot be the same, right? Because if the A and B team were the same, then by the definition of a function, there would only be like one pair in this, in this function. Right, because a function maps each set to a unique value, but if the A and the B team become one team, right? If the average team and the beach team become the average avalanche beach team, 
then that means choice function per definition means that this one value and these teams are then all just one value, they're just one team. We might call them the A team, or the B team is just the A team. Then for this, for the, for this team, there's only one value. So you would, this function would specify only one dog. And by looking at the function and seeing, oh, this has only has one entry, you would know that uh, the, the teams are the same. And we will see that this implies then that the necessarily the uh, p is true. I mean, it's clear that if you find the, if you get the choice function and it only has one entry, and then you conclude, oh, that means the teams are the same, then you can also conclude, oh, that must mean that both dogs are immunized, right? It's sort of the, the chain of logic is clear here. Because we define a function as this, this silly set of pairs, like, like in set theory, this is like the function is a graph. And because we define set extensionality as two sets collapsing, if they have the exactly the same elements, even if they're formally differently def defined, things come together in a way that the, the, the existence of the choice function tells us uh, something about the, um, the propositions in which terms the sets are defined. And of course, you know, just saying there exists a choice function doesn't realize a choice function. Um, but um, uh, in, in the case that this, this um, uh, choice function only has one entry, we get uh, the collapse of the sets. And in the case, the choice function has two entries. Um, and, um, and, and for this, you better look at the proof that will come in a second. But, but conceptually, like if you were given a concrete choice function and it has two entries, that means the, the, the uh, sets are different and you can get two different values. And then you could reason in a similar way uh, that that means that you found that um, you cannot put them in the same team. Um, okay. Uh, the, I mean, the, the case where it collapses is clearer for the case where um, they are apart. Uh, it has a more if clauses that we have to check and that's what the, the proof is really about. And so let's get into that. Okay, yeah, as I've written down, the existence of a choice function f decides p as in it implies excluded middle for p. Okay, and here I talk about the story, okay. So here, this is the, uh, the sets again, I've written it down. If you follow along in the proof, now you know, uh, can write it down with pen and paper because we're going to argue a lot in terms of this. So, firstly, um, we do some rewrites. So, we take this A, it's written down like this, uh, by the definition of um, set below notation, right, this translates to that, this, you know, I make use of all the things that I painfully discussed before. Um, we use the distributivity to rewrite this a little bit, right? We write this uh, such because the, the U equals zero is, is both here and uh, we uh, recognize, you know, the claim that the set equals this is really, really this statement, right? If any term is in A, that means the term is zero or the term is one and P holds, right? This is what, what the definition of A really says. And similar, we can do this with, with uh, B. It's basically the same, except the zero and one are uh, twisted around. Okay. So, um, some observations. So if I claim that zero is in A, right? If I claim zero is in A, then um, this implies um, um, yeah, then then this is trivially true here, yeah, right? To claim zero is in A holds because uh, zero is zero, and so so I know this. And similarly for for one, right? Um, you can we, we like directly see because this is this uh, disjunction. Uh, t equals one is fulfilled for exactly for one, and so I already know this. Um, so the the um, inside is here. Okay, both of the sets A and B definitely have one uh, member, and I point this out because it's a condition of a choice function, right? You you have to have non-empty sets to reach into them and pick an element out of them. Okay, um, and it also you know it's funny because because you know that A and B have each have one element. If you don't think too fast about it, if you don't think uh, a lot about it, then you would think, oh, well, the choice function is clear. I take the zero from A and the one from B, right? This is a, I have a choice. And that would sound okay, but the problem is, of course, that 
uh, this does not work if A and B collapses because then you made two different choices for one and the same set, right? This is sort of the joke about the whole thing that this naive cho uh, choice is does not work because of extensionality. Okay, um, so yeah, we m make more uh, observations. So again, you should maybe write down um, these these two formulas because we are arguing a lot of, in terms of this. So if P holds, assuming P holds, then this becomes true, right? And uh, anything ends true, uh, then you can just drop the, the 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 true thing from the conjunction in reasoning about the conjunction. So in that case, if P holds, then A is just defined by the element zero and one. So A becomes zero and one. And similarly, uh, yeah, since, since the disjunction is commutative, um, this follows as well. And so as I've argued before, like informally uh, above, if P holds, then both sets are actually just a simple set with two elements. So both sets are actually the same. And so if P holds, both sets actually collapse. So I've also like described this in words. Um, if P holds, then just looking at the definition of, of A and B, tells us that they actually be became the same set. And so this domain is in that case that P holds actually um, just a singleton, right? And so also, you know, this is a Im important part to point out because some people get sometimes confu confused over that. Um, this choice function maps from the set holding A and B to the union of A and B, um, but the set AB is not necessarily a set with two elements, right? It can also be a set with one element. And since we don't assume the, the axiom, uh, um, since, on, since we don't assume the excluded middle, um, we, um, we don't postulate that either the set has set as one or two elements, right? Because the, the in-between scenarios, right? This, this, if, if for example, P isn't stays undecidable, then this never becomes either set with one or two elements, right? This is in, in the spectrum area. So uh, this set here is also uncountable, right? Um, and you know, some people sometimes think trip over this because uh, because of this standard implication that they only, like in classical mathematics that the only uncountable sets are those with cardinality bigger than um the natural numbers right so the first uncountable ordinal or if you adopt um <sighs> don't want to get into this um you know uh or if you assume the continuum hyp hypothesis then the reals let's say the reals um people think of like people make this association between uncountable and the real numbers or bigger sets but uh, if you actually listen to the word uncountable, just says this, the set is not countable, right? And so uh, this set um, f for which we cannot describe any cardinality, it can be in this in-between space between one and two, right? Um, like, like, we, like there's an in-between in space between provably immunized and provably not immunized. Um, there is a, a space of this odd subsets, which you have not decided which direction they go yet. So this is an uncountable set. So we apply the axiom of choice in this case to an uncountable set, not a set of two elements. I mean, it's certainly not a set of two elements because we see if P holds its a set of one element, right? So uh, this is, is, it is a sort of subfinite choice, right? We, are, we only have very small, uh, sets involved here but we have a very general range of uh, propositions that we can you know use in our constructions of subsets and that's how it happens that this the, the strongest form of choice is needed for this this theorem but in this set theories you can adopt dependent choice and so on and it will not imply excluded middle for example okay um yeah okay then going on with uh, the implications here so if provably provenly uh, p is uh, uh, false then um, you have you know something and false and then this becomes false so what is left for for a is only that uh, t equals zero survives and oh sorry 
Yeah. Um, and so in this case, not P implies A is the singleton with just zero in it. And similarly, uh, B would do the singleton with one in it. And since, and now here we use uh, zero is not one, since the, these sets are not the same, we find that A and B are also not the same, right? So if, now this is what I referred to formally uh, before, I, as well in the in the you know doc description, if P are false, then they separate truly and become really the simple singleton sets. So these are just the extreme cases that we've now discussed. Um, yeah, and further another observation. So um, you know, if P holds, we saw that then the, the these become both this simple set. And okay, if P holds, then the zero is in A and one is in A. And that's clear. But also the other direction holds if Oh, sorry, if one is an A, then this also implies P. So this is actually equivalent. So look at the definition here. If one is an A, right? So plug in here for T one, and it says one equals zero or one equals one and P. Using uh, the uh, disjunctive syllogism, right? Um, so we have it's it's not the case that zero is one and if this says uh, zero is one then we can drop this false um proposition from the disjunction right I, you know i'm really baby stepping here it's clear that if this is false then you can drop this and so uh if you claim that one is an a then you claim that one is one and p okay one is one is also tautology falls out so if you claim one is an a then you also claim p right and similarly, if you claim zero is in B, then you claim also P. And again, with the dogs, this makes it, my dog, my dog story is the best here. It makes it completely clear. If you say that dog zero is in the B team, right? So somehow uh, the dog Alice made it to the beach team. Well, then it must be that, um, that both dogs are immunized, right? Otherwise, she, the dog would not be allowed to the beach team. So, to claiming that Alice is in the in the uh, beach team is to claim that they are immunized, right? You see that, um, right? And so you see how membership, simple membership statements, um, have an effect on the status of the propositions in which terms these sets are defined. Okay. Okay, so um, then here, uh, like a trivial side note again, um, if you have a function and you have two elements which are the same, then the output must also be the same by the definition of a function. And so if you have the contrapositive, now I think now we're through with all the, the, the logic statements that I listed in the start. Uh, the contrapositive means if the output of two functions are different, that, that necessarily means that the input of these functions from which these values resulted are also different, right? It's just a contrapositive of this trivial statement. And now apply to our settings, setting. Um, if the, um, okay, if the uh, output of two functions are not the same, then that means um, that you have, um, th then that means that the input was different, right? And if the input is different, then P does not hold, right? Uh, yeah, I, I think I did not mention this one. So uh, this relation in the other direction is also just a contrapositive of, um, of, uh, have I not written down as explicitly? I know here it is here. Yeah. So, you know, we said if this is true, then the sets are equal. So if the, if the input values are not true, then P is also not true by the contrapositive. Um, so if the output values of the functions are different, then the input values of the functions are different. And then by what I just said, P does not hold. And if P does not hold, then that means uh, a becomes the singleton, p becomes the singleton, right? So if the if the function values are different, then this derivation derivation which I just gave you says also how they are different, right? 
because there's a few values with the setup that we created, you know, this sort of um, doc scenario. Um, if the values are different, then uh, it is because these input values are different like that. Okay, and then what a choice function can only do one thing with if the, the setup is like this. If it reaches into X, it can only take zero. If it reaches into Y, it can only take one. So it means the choice function um, has these output values, right? So these other output values, the output value where A maps to uh, one and B maps to zero, uh, would mean that the, out the, the uh, output values are different, but then if they are different, then they are this and this is different. So we've just shown that this is an impossible uh, scenario for the for the um, um, choice function, right? So we, we have just looked at one particular case for a choice function, po a potential output, and, and shown that it is impossible. And again, in terms of dogs, it's clear. Um, the choice function, whatever it is, cannot say that, oh, I take uh, dog one from Alice and dog zero from from uh, sorry dot one from uh, the avalanche team and do dog zero from beach team that cannot be a choice function because if the dogs are in the team of the other um, person so to speak, uh, other dog so to speak right if the if the dog one is in 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 the the, the avalanche team and if the do if the dog zero is in the in the beach team right, if there's a crossover so to speak then that means they are in the same like they are in the in the team of the other um, dog so that means they are uh, both together that means they are the same team so that means there's just one team and so the output values cannot be different right uh, again this is a similar sort of argument right you, you play with the collapse due to extensionality um, and so this is one uh, trust function here uh, I just written down these indices indicating the output values in the order you can ignore the, the indices but they are just so we, that we recognize which trust function we talk about easier so this is an impossible choice function, actually. Okay, um, will be uh, relevant then for the last step of this proof. Okay. Yeah. So since this uh, since this class is impossible, like this is absurdum. Um, if you have a disjunction, uh, then we can drop it, and below a uh, disjunction will appear. So. Um, yeah, okay, it's only now that I write down a choice function here, like again, the formal definition. Um, okay, I think we don't need this line, this is just a fact. Uh, now, finally, to compute uh, the more about choice functions, I uh, will build the union of A and B, right? This is like a little bit of a formal step. T being in the union means T being, like, this is the clause for A, this is the clause for B, um, we can use the distributivity to rewrite this thing. It turns out to be this, like this is just one rewrite step um, using distributivity. And here now we see either this or this, but um, actually the left clause here is strictly stronger than this more complicated right clause. Like if you have already proven that it's either T0 or T1, then um, uh, then the whole thing is already true, right? And you don't have to do the same thing again. And P, right? The, this is just a, like a harder case to satisfy than this. So whenever you have proven this, which is necessary and sufficient um, for uh, validating this whole class. So we find that the union is really just um, zero and one. So the union is just this actually finite set, the properly finite set, okay. So um, if we find uh, in a conjunction, um, which will be the case below if you find like an, an end statement and um, this sort of clause pops up that the um, the function is binary valued then I will also drop it right this is an established fact the output of a function like given a choice function the output will be just the dogs okay you you have not you, have, you don't have a function in the in the in the, in the union which um, uh, is anything other than like there, there's only equality signs uh, associated with the dogs right if you have an output value then it's indeed the, one of the dogs zero and one okay and so fi finally the last step of the proof and then okay, you get a, a bonus uh, analysis and also another dog picture so um, the uh, definition of a choice function 
you know, it is applicable to uh, inhabited sets. We saw that the set is in inhabited. Um, and trust function says f of a must be in a and f of b must be in b and must reach into the fun into the sets. And so uh, what does this translate to? Well, we now take again the definition of a. Uh, let me just be super explicit. So here, this is the t in a means this. So we use this with t being f of a. So we get this this chunk. Um, so we have this here and this here. And uh, again, distributivity, we can rewrite this. So this statement, then this just says that the return value of uh, A is a dog. And this also just says the return value of B is a dog. We already know that. Here I argued that we can you know, just drop this. Okay, this is fulfilled. Then we are left with this class and this class. Um, again, with distributivity, we can um, pull out P. And so we get this, but we've already proven that the output uh, values of f being different gives not p, right? Um, I've proven this above and don't even scroll up because you remember. So we have proven that, formally proven that existence of a choice function implies that you know something um, about uh, p, which I've already argued. And this completes the proof, Jesus Christ. And we are at one and a half hours and we still have a little bit to go, but I hope that this painful, like formal step through it uh, gives you something. Okay, so um, now that we have uh, gotten the, this formal proof, you know, it uses very little, just this, this few set theory axioms and then we have this implication from, of choice to lamb. Uh, we do an explicit analysis and then we see sort of the comparison with the, um, with the uh, classical case as well, which is the clear. Okay, so here first the dog picture. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, I, I write this down because uh, from this um, equivalence of two disjunctions, the smaller disjunction, the bigger dis disjunction here, we can also immediately see from the from the classically possible uh, choice function values that um, this must be uh, implied because the classical choice function values all imply one of those things uh, directly. So. Here is a list of all, uh, in principle, possible choice functions, whereby the last um, is also contradictory, as we've already seen. So, you know, if the choice function that you actually get, you no, know, again, to, we, we said that if you, um, if you uh, are tasked with giving a choice function, you cannot do the job, because if you had a choice function, you would know, it, it would imply something about the, the status. Um, uh, but uh, we can, of course, easily reason that, like, naturally reason that um, if excluded middle would hold, what would be possible choice functions? And uh, implicitly, these three choice functions were already part of the proof above, but here I've written them down again. So uh, one choice function that could in principle be, be one um, is where A is mapped to uh, zero and B is also map be mapped to zero, right? So this is, would be... Um, one of the scenarios, like in the, before we even know anything about P, we could think this could could be a choice function. Okay, and um, as uh, as argued, you know, then we would see B, uh, the beach team holds the Ellis dog, and so um, we would, could also reason, or this can only be the case if um, P is true, if they are actually in the same team. So again, this classical choice function, right, which we don't, we, you know, we don't have that, but looking at that, this could only be a choice function in the case that uh, P holds. Similarly, both mapping to one would also mean they're in the same team and would also have the same consequence. In, the, in this case, um, that A uh, maps to one and B map, uh, A maps to zero and B maps to one, then that would mean that A and B cannot be the same because one function cannot for one input value have two different output values. So we would know the inputs are different and therefore um, if the inputs are different, then um, logically speaking, that that implies they are um, that we know that they are not immunized. Again, uh, the 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 dog scenario, like in practice, you would probably like, I would I would assume that you, you you would say, well, let's not give the dogs together. So also in the undecided status, you would probably have them apart. But this is not part of the mathematical proof. This is just your your 
you know, the, the human reasoning about not wanting to get uh, uh, contract the, the illness, right? This is another axiom, so to speak. <laughs> So that, that, that would say, um, uh, even if in, in, in later it would turn out that, that you get the pass and they are actually um, uh, they are actually uh, immunized, if at the point where you have to make the decision forever of having them together or apart, uh, if you don't know, then just uh, have them apart because it is like bad for the dogs to get sick. Uh, potentially then you would have this sort of other axiom that is sort of a, I would make the, the semantics more complicated but I just want to po point it out from from the dog perspective but again from uh, from the um, from the purely logical perspective there's no rule to apply in case you have not decided either case but if there is a decision being handed to you if you say oh, this is actually the, 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 the choice function that you got, get then it implies uh, not P for sure this true either way Okay, and then we've already argued this uh, fourth possibility is not possible. Okay. More observations regarding the scenario uh, in case you hasn't, haven't get it yet. Okay, that's another dog picture, by the way. Um, not sure if this is a good rescue dog. Looks li pretty uh, wolf-like. <laughs> but okay. So, yeah. Um, good. Um, here I've written down the, the choice functions above uh, explicitly, right? So again, P is equivalent to either of those options, right? So this is the first two. I write them down here again, uh, with or without the A. Not P is equivalent um, to this. So if you're given this choice function, you, don't, you know not P. If you are no P, then you would choose um, this, this choice function, okay? And uh, why I, I write this down again here is the nice thing is that you know even up front you can design two sets which capture these scenarios right so the um, the scenario uh, this should be zero zero or comma zero one so this scenario where the A and P collapsed and um, you uh, sign zero uh, no. Yeah, and you assign zero to them, both collapse and you assign zero to them. This scenario and this scenario where um, they split and you assign um, one, like the default dog to both, these two options can actually be captured inside of one fu um, uh, function, uh, one set, let me do this set, um, where A is mapped to zero, right? Because, because um, uh, let's see here. A is A in zero one is mapped to zero, but it's A is also mapped to zero in this case where they collapse, right? This is the one where they don't collapse. This is the one where they collapse. You can capture both of them in in with this um, definition, where A always maps to zero and B, the beach team maps to a, a value a dog C. Let's see the dog here, and this C dog is in case P is uh, provably false becomes dog one <laughs> and if case uh, p is provably true right, then, it's, then the, the then this is false and then c is the empty set so it's zero uh, in, in that case it be becomes zero and then they collapse so what i do here is i define this this choice function with an if class and this is an if class that depends on on p you could express it like that right, this, this is one set which captures two classical functions at once but um, I, I point this out because constructively this thing is not a function right because for a function per definition of a function for every input value you must be able to give a unique return value like there, there says an uh, existence unique existence of a return value but um, since in the constructive reading an existential quantifier means that you can actually specify an element um, but you can't here because uh, the the dog C is undecided as long as P is undecided. This is actually not like if we use if we, if we like talk here in this recurs recursive scenario. This is actually not a function because it depends on this undecided if clause, right? It, it does not actually map the beach team to any particular dog. I just capture both options here in with, with one set and. 
if p holds then this becomes uh, one uh, possibility if p does not hold like provably then it uh, becomes one so classically this is, these are two of the three choice functions but uh, uh, constructively this is not even a function and uh, similar with the other one so here is another um here's another uh, like set which captures two of the um of the choice function at once um but it's, it's not an answer to the choice function existence requirement um if we read the quantifiers constructively if we actually want our set theory to speak um of, of uh, Functions. As long as we want to ha uh, keep a constructive reading, a recursive reading of functions, then we should not adopt um, fun functions which we cannot realize. Arguably, it depends. You know what you want to do with your theory. Of course, um, it's it's pretty if your theory is be able to speak of uh, realizable objects. Um, you know, maybe even in a you know this theory, for example, all the axioms ab above that are stated for set theory, uh, apart from excluded middle and also other stronger stronger collection axioms and some choice axioms they can all be um, interpreted in some martin Lewis type theory for example okay and i point out again that constructively these sets you know these would be functions they are not even countable because you don't know what the domain is you don't know if the domain has for example zero or one teams right these are these these are um uncountable sets even if they look <laughs> small <laughs> okay 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 so um that said um i have uh, two more sections one concerns interpretations um talks a little bit of you know a very naive approach to sort of um give an interpretation to these things in ter terms of um functions in a programming language in this case just python sadly untyped but it's quick to code up and just want to point out some aspects relating to the proof and the, the difference here set theory versus languages and so on and finally after this i go quickly through the proof of uh, regularity and we might actually make it in under two hours okay um so let me just read what I've written down here. So let's think of potential programming language interpretations of the scenario that we just had. Um, and here, you know, um, to comparison, now I will adopt, uh, you know, there's an, an infinite set and, and there's at least, you know, let's say there's a, there's a function spaces, just so that we have a theory which is also can do arithmetic like, um, like interpret functions and these kind of things because we want to like mirror um, what we have here on the prog programming side and Python is of course a Turing programming uh, capable language um, and Python also has a notion of comprehension and a notion of sets and I can have like comprehended iterators that I, I can cast to sets although we will see this is a little bit problematic in Python and it doesn't even have types types and so on it would be nice um, I will comment on that a little bit so um, the this function that I described before, right? This this would be function, this classical function, but not constructive function with um, it maps a to zero and maps uh, b to to c to uh, c. Uh, I can actually like to some extent capture in Python, and it's not a problem. But the problem is really that the Python functions are not really functions in the set theoretical sense. You know, they are not. They, they don't have. Uh, the Python function in particular, they don't even have a domain because they are untyped. But also, um, uh, in, in either I code it up in a way that some generic comprehended set is not even like terminating, it's not even computing itself. Like the subset is not even computing. I can have predicates which are, you know, infinite for loops that never like come to an end, and uh, the value is never decided. Or in the way I coded it up here is also this this simple f function if i pass it the wrong object it will not even terminate so it's not really a function in the, in the in the set so it's really not a good model i'm just making some naive like um like giving you some naive pointers to how to realize it and what matches with the set theory and what what does not um, um and this is like from the angle that i say i, I actually like i force myself to to interpret the scenario you will see that sort of that implies that if you have a header choice function that actually your language is strong enough to decide this p which does not um 
is not faithful to the set theory, in which case you cannot decide the P. Okay, uh, I don't know if that ma made sense. You will see maybe better what I mean in a second. Okay, so I've written uh, uh, down some code here. Let me actually uh, paste this into uh, this. Okay, so I have here Python. I uh, paste the function here. So what does this function do? Um, this is the F, uh, which auto mirror this thing. So um, the idea is that um, I, what, I, what I want to do is, you know, if P is true, then if P holds, right? Then we said the A and B collapses and then there should be only one output value. And since A is in this function already mapped to zero, then if P holds, I want both of them to be mapped to zero. If um, P is false, then uh, there's no other way of mapping uh, B to one. And if B, P, P, uh, P is false, then you know B will be the singleton which just holds one. And so basically I just need to map the first entry to zero. And in the case that B um, is uh, not the two element set in which case this value is already decided, then I can actually map this to, to one as well. So one uh, implementation that captures this idea is here. So I have this F. If zero is an X, right? Uh, so if you pass A, then um, zero is an A anyway, so it will return zero. So this the first class is, is implemented. And if um, a equals B, then I also already done. If A is not B, then B is the singleton which only holds one and then their only choice would be one. So this actually does the job for us, right? Again, the difference is here, this is not a set function. Like if the job was, if your boss said, I want to have a set function capturing um, the the membership, then this thing here, uh, like this thing, it does not even have a domain, right? I can pass anything I can, um, I cannot, uh, this is not like a set of one or two pairs, right? This is like an if, the generic if clause. Um, and also uh, it's clear that if I can test membership, then I can also test uh, if, uh, like this This actually allows an input which has either one or two elements. This is different than, than uh, the scenario that we just had where in the one world where P holds, the only input can be a two element set. And in the, in the other world where P does not hold, there's two different inputs and they're all both singletons. So this is sort of, this is like a fail safe implementation um, in a world where it is already decided what P is, right? I hope that makes sense. Um, and yeah, so I can, um, I, by the way, I have implemented this in a way that because I already spoke about that, that I can easily implement uh, Python objects which are not terminating. I, I can define sets like formally design, define sets which never like um, return the um, the programming flow, which just run indefinitely. I will give you an example in a second. And so I, I coded up this function in a way that you pass actually a function which returns a set. You don't pass a set to this, but you pass a function which returns a set. And only when you use it, evaluates this function to give you the set. This is basically an, a delayed evaluation so that everything happens uh, in the caller body. Um, yeah, I can uh, I can pass these these examples. So as I said, um, this function is designed so that in a way that it takes whatever, right? So this this in all words, whether p holds or p does not hold, like in both of these binary worlds, in both of these interpretations, in both of, both of these models, in both of these semantics, where where I have decided p, um, I can write a function which works for both, right? I, so um, if um, this job is to give you this this fail safe function and not some set fails function, if you don't if you don't do set theory, but if you work in this like Python implementation and interpretation, then you can design upfront uh, this function f one zero zero one um, which works for both cases. Okay, just want, want to point out that that I mean this is more or less a fold of set theory if you want, uh, like it's a fold of um, separation and, and excluded middle that these things uh, don't go together if you adopt choice. I, I mean, unless you have the problem with, with uh, ex excluded middle anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, this implementation obviously takes also inputs that are, uh, you know, just have, have nothing to do with the problem. This is completely untyped. 
um, I can uh, come up with this um, with this sort of this is Python with this manual type check, right? I define this function. Um, uh, yeah, this is a little bit too big for the screen. Let me just use this here. Um, so this uh, you know explicitly checks it takes uh, this x and sees what the types is must be set and um, checks the cardinality i can all do these sort of things uh, the thing is this function also checks um, like what p is right this function this object it could never be the set theoretical function because this can look into the undecidable predicate and, and tell, just tell me what it was because this this thing uh, can check for the cardinality um, because I mean it's a language everything is, runs in a computer I don't have abstract subsets or something something like that um, or if I do then it does not terminate as we will see in a second so uh, I can apply this function to a bunch of objects the same objects I had before Opsala. so I paste it here yeah okay this is what I coded up so um, this checks it, you know, see that this is one possible world um, that I, that I um, deem to be a valid type in this function. And this just decides, oops, uh, I have to add an F here. Ah, damn it. So um, this, I forgot an, an, an F here, okay. Let me actually copy it from here. Yeah, so here you see that um, I pass it this set and it sees, oh, this is a two element set. So I know that the predicate uh, proposition P was true. So they can inspect this because it, this function here operates only in one of the, the models where I've actually decided P. Um, and it does the type check correctly. Okay, so and, and here finally, I want to show you that I like at least with this implementation that I have here and set comprehension is sort of weak here. I can actually like completely wreck the, the, the Python basically. I have here, uh, this natural number stream. So this is an iterable, which if I call it, um, I can just go through and it gives me all natural numbers, right? I can pop all natural numbers. And what I do is I define a proposition P as follows. It says, uh, return true if the cardinality of this set of all natural numbers is seven, uh, which in set theory would be, of course, uh, false. Um, but uh, since, firstly, the length um, of the set is not designed for infinite sets, so it is not really a cardinality in that in mathematical sense. And the problem is here that the set cast uh, on a stream of elements, it works if it's finite, but if it's infinite, then what it will actually do according to my infinite stream is it will actually never hold. So I sort of mimic here a predicate where I cannot query the true value of it. It is basically undecided. It will run forever. So if I take this and define uh, my A sub subsets, we have my avalanche subset. Um, what happens then if I call F of A is that it will actually go for natural numbers and just pop natural numbers and, and the, the proposition I know whether or not the natural numbers has cardinality of seven. Actually, it does not decide. It just runs on forever. Okay, so I, I, I will I'll show you here just a, sort of the analogy of uh, this, this uh, the in-between world. I decided a, a function which returns a Boolean formally, right? This is just a, it's just a function. I've written here, it down here as a lambda function, but it's just a function. I could make a Python type annotation that it goes to the Booleans, but in reality, it actually, it's not a function at all. It does not hold. It's a like, it's a, a computable function in the sense of, um, of uh, uh, computability theory, but one of the partial ones, which which actually not, do not terminate. Okay. Okay, I got some water. Um, I have about ten minutes to go, so uh, I think we will manage to end this under two hours. The last thing that we we'll discuss is a similar but now much shorter proof of the uh, excluded middle from uh, the classical regularity axiom. 
and uh, then I also show you some more dogs. <laughs> um, okay, so the axiom of regularity says that for every inhabited set S, classically you could say a non-empty set, but here this is a stronger formulation, every set for which we know that there's an element in it, uh, there exists at least one element T in S, which is uh, completely different from S. So in every set S, there is an at least one set T, which has an empty intersection with it. Um, and in a, in a sense, this is a sort of choice axiom as well. If you consider the universe of sets, then it says for every set, there is one particular set in it. I mean, it's not a choice function. It's a, it don't, doesn't speak of unique existence, um, but it has a similar sort of flavor, right? It reaches into sets and says there is one set with a particular property. Um, in this case, um, okay. So uh, the proof goes as follows. Uh, firstly, so I, I want to highlight f if the, the particular special element T is the singleton set holding zero, then the definition exactly says then this means S is not allowed to hold zero, right? And what we are going to use to imply them is again the set B from above, the beach team. Right, for the beach team, um, we've proven that if L is the dog number zero is in the beach team, that means we know that P holds. So um, this will um, be in the result, we will use that if zero is B, then the, the, this is equivalent to P. Um, to prove X to the middle, we actually we just need to prove series in B or series not in B, right? This is actually a bounded excluded middle uh, statement. Um, and so the proof goes on as follows. The definition, one of the clauses in the definition of, of B was that the dogs are these binary values, zero and one, right? There was also another clause about uh, about the other dog and, and P, but this is an implication. Like if U is in B, then it's one of these values. Um, then, uh, you know, we infer that if U is in B, then in the case that u is zero, that means the zero is in b. Uh, and also the one is by definition the singleton here. So um, the axiom now says there exists a t in b with a special property. Uh, this is guaranteed. Um, and then because we have this implication, there's only two cases. You know, we, we get this disjunction for free from the definition of u and we know that there's one in it. In this case, uh, P holds, you know, this is what we've shown um, above. And in that case, if the special element T is the singleton with zero, then we know that it's not the case that zero is in B. So we have this. And this is excluded middle because uh, this uh, zero in B is um, equivalent to P, right? So again, here we have another existence statement similar to the function existence in the choice axiom where it says, in every set is something in it. Um, and in in even shorter way, this implies then with this sort of construed beach team set, which um, relates membership to generic predicates, um, we see that we cannot adopt this play, this, this simple um, existence claim that the regularity axiom uh, is. Uh, but um, there is, the, as I said previously, there is this induction axiom um, for sets, which is even sort of closer to the idea behind the set in a sense, um, that is classically equivalent. So it's not a big deal that regularity doesn't work because there's the equivalent absolute induction axiom, classically equivalent axiom, which you can still adopt in a constructive context. And with this, a final dog picture. Um, I let you uh, let you go. I hope you learned something. I know I, um, I it was not my shortest rant I ever had, but there was a lot of topics to go through and I wanted to cover the thing from various angles. Um, I hope you learned something. I wish you a good night.